Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of May 13th, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the project's page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussions with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we look at Hillcorp's recent way over the top response to the proposal to close their unique loophole in the Alaska oil tax code. Second, we look at the common theme underlying the current problems at both ADA and the Permanent Fund Board. And third, we discuss whether there are any lessons from the Fairbanks Prop A election that can be applied statewide. And now, let's join Michael. Well, Brad, it is, um, I mean, tomorrow's the end. Tomorrow is the very end at midnight. And you could see these busy little beavers down there in Juneau who have been real lackadaisical, you know, usually in the first part of the session. But boy, when they get down to the end of the session, they get serious. You know, time compression is a weapon, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but of course, the big news is the whole thing over the energy debate in the uh, uh, in the uh, down in the South Central area, in the inlet, and of course, that's led to some other issues, including them them the they having us over a barrel, and uh, we're going to talk about that first. So uh, take a crack at it, my friend. Well, one of the most out concerning. Uh, uh, quotes I've seen not only c- come out, not only of this session, but, but, but a lot of sessions uh, uh, looking back over the years is a quote that came from Kathy Giesel uh, in response to um, the Senate Resources Committee or Senate uh, Finance Committee stripping out a provision that had been included in the Senate Resources Committee in what's sort of becoming the omnibus uh, energy bill. Uh, we talked about it a little bit, uh, hit on it a little bit in last week's show. What Senate Resources had done at Bill Wilikowski's, uh proposal was to include a correction for the Hillcorp loophole that we've talked about on the show a lot. Uh, the loophole that allows Hillcorp to pay less than the corporate taxes uh, every other oil and gas producer, major oil and gas producer in the state pays. Um, and Wilikowski had it in- introduced in Senate Resources a, uh, uh, as part of the energy omnibus, a provision that would close that loophole and essentially a, a result in Hillcorp leveling up with everybody else, paying an additional $100 million to level up on their uh, overall oil taxes with, uh, with, all of the, with all of the other producers. That uh, got added. Uh, Kathy Giesel voted for it. It passed in Senate Resources on a 4-3 vote. And it goes to uh, Senate Finance. The bill goes to Senate Finance. And Senate finance strips out a number of provisions that were added in Senate resources. But one of the provisions it strips out um, is the $100 million uh, closure of the loophole that got added in resources. And turns out there was a lot of of back back room stuff going on. The governor had said that he opposed uh, adding that provision. The House Rules Committee, uh, in response to Senate resources adding that, gathered a bunch of Senate bills together uh, in rules uh, and looked like they were going to start stuffing various provisions in those in retaliation for the Hillcorp uh, uh, in response to what Senate resources had done. 
And Hillcorp itself sends out a letter to all of the uh, South Central utilities uh, that that utilize gas, NSTAR, as well as the electric utilities that burn gas to generate electricity. And South Central send out a, a letter to all of them saying, hey, you know, you take this hundred million dollars away. We're not sure what we're going to be doing in the Cook Inlet. Uh, we have to reevaluate everything uh, and uh, and look at our look at look at you know what we're doing going forward. This in a in an environment where obviously Cook Inlet gas is a is a concern. So that's sort of the backstory. And then we get to we get to the story, the ADN story on uh, on what House or Senate Finance had done, stripping it out. And here's the, the quote that just stuns me. Anchorage Republican Senator Kathy Giesel had also supported the tax hike on the Texas-based operator. She said it was not unexpected that the provision had been removed after a pressure campaign from Hillcorp. Here's the quote. They've really got us over a barrel, she said, talking about Hillcorp, um, Hillcorp's threats to reduce development uh, in, the, uh, in the Cook Inlet. Uh, if um, if the tax hike, the tax change, tax leveling uh, went through, and in that quote from a state senator, the 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 majority leader of the Senate major of the of the Senate majority, the the a long, I mean, one of the proponents of SB twenty one back in the day, a long defender of the industry in various at various times over the last decade. They've talking about Hillcorp really got us over a barrel uh, as she's explaining why the Senate caved, the Senate Finance Committee caved on the, on the Hillcorp tax provision. That's hugely, hugely troubling. We have, I mean, the state has a, a sort of a, a unified approach to oil taxes. Part of it comes from production taxes. Part of it comes from royalty. Part of it comes from property taxes. Uh, and part of it comes from the corporate income tax. And together, all of those provisions sort of fulfill, are intended to fulfill the constitutional requirement in, in Article 8, Section 2, that the legislature shall provide for the utilization, development, and conservation of all natural resources belonging to the state, including land and waters, for the maximum benefit of its people. And that when you look at from an oil standpoint, when you look at all of these various tax regimes, they're all they all weave together in a way that that is intended to elicit from the oil industry the 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 revenue maximizing point, the the the, the revenue maximization that you can that you can realize from from the states from the state's oil consistent with that constitutional obligation. What the Hillcorp loophole does is blow a hole in that sort of overall weave of taxes um, and, and, and revenues, blow a hole in that overall weave. And, and, and what the Willikowski Amendment supported by Giesel was intended to do was to put that weave back together again and make sure that we are achieving, as, as intended by the Constitution, the, the revenue maximization uh, from our oil resources. And revenue maximization doesn't mean taxing every, you know, taxing everything, taking all of their profits. It means taxing it to a point. Revenue maximization means, or revenue optimization, means taxing it to a point where the state's able to extract the optimum revenues. If if you can overtax, which results in underinvestment and re, which results in a drop in in revenues over the long term, so you try to find that point where you optimize. Uh, revenues consistent with the consistent with the constitutional obligation, and Hill, the Hillcorp loophole had blown a blown a hole in that about a hundred million dollar hole in that. So, when you try to close that, and then you have a producer tell you, "Well, you know, I'll just take my take my dogs and go home, or I'll take my I'll take nice my gas field you got there. It'd be a shame if something happened to it." That's just that's just a that's just hugely concerning. We've we've gotten ourselves in this position a number of ways. I mean, Hillcorp essentially has established a monopoly in the in the Cook Inlet, and an economist might look at this hundred million dollar loophole as as Hillcorp's monopoly rent. That's what they that's the additional they're able to extract from the state 
um, uh, in term as a result of having a monopoly. And what and what Giesel's comment does is sort of is sort of confirm that's monopoly rent. I mean, they they're saying they will they will take their you know balls and go home if they if they don't get their additional monopoly rent. And and there's other causes for this as well. The failure of the Department of Natural Resources to push forward on stalled projects in the Cook Inlet, like Bluecrest Cosmopolitan Project, a project where the leaseholder has the obligation to develop the project, but they haven't because they claim they can't get financing. Well, okay. Then, you know, the remedy for that under the leases is they is the leases get terminated for failure to develop. And you go find somebody else, you release out there for somebody who is going to is gonna live up to that obligation. Or by doing that, you force Bluecrest to sell to, to maximize their revenue out of it before the leases get terminated to sell to somebody who does have the capitalization to be able uh, to develop it. Um, but and and DNR's failure to push Bluecrest on this stalled project, I think, is contributing to the to the situation because we've got a situation in which Hillcorp's the major supplier, almost the only supplier of gas, and so they're able to extract this monopoly rent through these uh, through these sort of, of of threats. But it's, I mean, it's hugely concerning that you get to the point where, again, the majority leader of the state senate is saying they've got us over a barrel where we where we the state can be threatened effectively right by by a producer that if you don't give us our monopoly rent if you don't give us our you know these these loopholes that that we've that we've come upon if you don't give it to us we're going to take our ball and go home and that's just that that's just hugely concerning from a state standpoint you know something that would fix this if we had a plan to import gas from somewhere else and then you couldn't hold, they couldn't hold you over the the barrel. You know what I mean? I mean, if you had, if you'd already put some effort into this because you know, it's still the cheapest way to make things happen. Yes. I know you want Alaskan gas. I hear you, but if you at least, you know, got your ducks in a row and had a backstop of having an import LNG plan already in place, they wouldn't have you over a barrel. Yeah, the, the the I mean, it's lack of competition, and and LNG would represent injecting competition into the Cook Inlet, right? It's not it's not that Alaska is running out of gas; it's Alaska is running out of gas produced in Alaska. We can import gas. There's a huge amount of, of gas available worldwide. We can import gas and, and solve our problem that way, and that would that would create competition with with Hillcorp. Um, yeah, I, I mean, there's a number of ways pressing forward on if DNR had pressed forward on. On Bluecrest, if they'd said, "Look, you know, we're sorry, you can't find financing, but, but you know, you have a lease obligation to produce. If you can't find financing, if that happened in the lower 48, if that happened where we had private lessors, um, I mean, I was involved in these suits when I practiced in the lower 48. If we, if you had a situation where you had a private, a private uh, royalty owner and you had a lessor who was failing, failing to develop, and he said, "Oh, I just can't find financing," I mean, you just sue him. You just, you just sue to terminate the lease. And and you release out you release out to somebody who can develop it. That's that's a normal, accepted, right. ongoing procedure in the lower forty eight. But here, we don't do that, um, and and so we get ourselves into these situations where we have a producer that has us over the barrel, and that's that's unacceptable. We we need to find a way to deal with this situation so we don't have the state uh, uh, at, uh, at at the mercy of producers. Well, I mean, maybe we need to stop. I mean, I hate to say it, and it's not a pipe dream. And I don't, I mean, that's, that's kind of the phrase that popped to mind, but you know, we need to stop looking for the perfect solution in it, you know, stop, stop bypassing the good solution in, in search of the perfect solution. We'd all love it to be nothing but Alaska gas that we burned here. Hell, we'd love it if it was all Alaska produced gasoline and diesel and everything else, but that just doesn't happen. It's just not going on because it's not affordable to do it. So somebody somewhere has to say it would be great if it was all Alaska gas, but we've got the solution here in LNG imported for now. Take the long game on the uh, internal LNG you know, uh, uh, usage of, of Alaska LNG, give it yourself some times and stop the crisis. But a crisis works for people. And that's why they're keeping it rolling in that regard. Yeah. Uh, it, it, I mean, you and I have talked on the show before, this is all protectionism. There's, there's bills. I mean, the royalty reduction is one of those is to, is to protect Cook Inlet against, essentially against competition. And this is the consequence <laughs> 
this is the consequence of, of what that sort of protectionism does. It puts cooking lint producers in a position where they can hold the state hostage and, 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 you know, and make threats like Hillcorp did with the, with the letter they sent out to the utilities, make threats that effectively cause the state to, to back off. Like I said, it's a nice gas field there. Be a shame if somebody walked away from it. That's uh, that's basically what they said in the letter. I mean, I just read that letter and I'm like, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, it would be a shame if somebody took what you, you know. I mean, I guess good for Hillcorp. I mean, they they're here to make money. There's no doubt about it. I'm, you know, Terry says Hillcorp is in the state to make a profit, not to be a charity funder, and I understand that. Uh, and they're doing their part. The problem is the legislature not really doing their part. I mean, there should be a, there's supposed to be a pushback, a tug of war between, you know, the, the, the powers that be on this and the corporations. And I mean, the corporation is doing what it's supposed to do, but what are the legislators doing? Well, yeah, Michael, I mean, yeah, they're not supposed to be a charity funder, but the state's supposed to enforce the constitutional obligation to, to maximize the benefit of the resources for its people. And, and Hillcorp, um, is is part of i mean good bad or indifferent oil companies come to alaska knowing that constitutional obligation is there oil companies come to alaska knowing that the state has a history in various ways of taxing them of weaving together a, a, a tax approach that that takes money out of uh, that takes money out of the oil companies consistent with the constitutional obligation they know all that hillcorp knew that when they came here i i'm going to tell you michael hillcorp when they when the doors close and they're in the conference room or they're in the in the boardroom, they are laughing. They are laughing because when they acquired BP, they were able to create this loophole by being a, an S corp as opposed to a C corp. That simple organizational structure is what leads to all this. And 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 I will bet you anything you want to bet that their economics said, okay, what if we lose that? Is it still an economic deal? Is it still a good deal? And the answer to that would have been yes. I mean, the sale price that the BP essentially, you know, fire sailed it to them was a good price under a lot of cases. And that's that's what Hillcorp has invested in, their purchase price. And I'm going to bet you that when they did the economics, they did a variability analysis. Of course they did on what happens if this loophole gets closed and the economics still worked. And they've been running this bluff on the state since they acquired that asset that, oh, my gosh, you know, we acquired it with those rules in place. And we thought, you know, we thought you'd live up to those rules. And so and so, yes, we're organized as an S Corp. And so we get the additional advantages out of that. When the doors close in the in the boardroom, they got to be laughing their asses off because, look, they're falling for this bluff and they're still falling for this bluff. We've been able to pull this off for however many years. We've been able to get, you know, $100 million a year for however many years it's been that's fallen that's fallen to the to Hillcorp's pocket. Way to go, guys. You know, keep it going. Keep it going as long as you can. You get, uh, we'll give you a, a piece of this yeah. in, ter in terms of a reward. And it's the state who looks like a fool in this situation. Right. Yeah, sure. As yeah. long as Hillcorp can run the bluff, great for them. But it's yeah. the state who's the fool. I can't blame Hillcorp for, I mean, I can't blame Hillcorp for playing within the rules as it is right now and just kind of trying to keep it going on. This is the legislature. Timothy says uh, it would be interesting to hear Sarah Vance's position on this since she was worried imported LNG companies might threaten Alaska in the future. Because in her visit with us last earlier or last week, she basically we were started talking about gas and, and the energy thing. And she's like, well, we're just worried that if it's LNG, they could cut us off at any time. And I'm like, well, who's they? And wait, isn't that what Hillcorp is threatening right now? I mean, it's a it's a valid question. Yeah, it's I, I mean, that that defense of, of, of being concerned about LNG isn't valid. There's a huge number of LNG producers in the world. There's a huge amount of LNG on the market. This isn't like we're going to become dependent on Russian LNG, right? And when Russia goes to war, we're going to cut them off. This isn't what's going on. Heck, the U.S. The U.S. is the globe's largest producer of LNG right now out of the out of the United States Gulf Coast. The world's largest producer of LNG. So what are you concerned? I mean, why are you concerned about supply? It's, it's, it's going to be there. 
And, and yes, you're exactly right. If the, your concern is we're going to get cut off by, by LNG supplies, however stupid that is. Right. You ought, to, you ought to be more concerned about what Hillcorp's doing to you. Hey, well, yeah, I mean, it's happening right now. It's not a what if, it's happening right this second, right here. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, joins us for the weekly top three. We just finished up with number one. Now we are on to number two. Why, oh, why are we having problems with these independent air quotes agencies brad what 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 are you talking about what do you mean here so in the past week there's been a lot of a, a continuing attention to two agencies one is ada the alaska import and export development authority uh there was testimony um senate finance sort of had a face-off between the critics of of ada Milt Barker and Greg Erickson, two longtime Alaskans, noted uh, economists, people who have been engaged in Alaska business forever, uh, uh, have written reports uh, critical of ADA and critical of the investments ADA has made. Uh, their first report uh, said that Alaska would have been better off had we not spent money through ADA and had we just invested the same amount of money in the permanent fund, we would have, we would have earned the state more money. The second report looks at Ada's defense that says, oh, but we create a bunch of jobs. And Erickson and, and Barker's second report says, no, you didn't create a bunch of jobs. Those jobs would have been created anyway. You just sort of were there there at their creation and, and you shouldn't get credit for them. And that was a that was a big hearing last week before Senate Finance. Randy Ruaro, Ruaro uh, who's the who's the, the head of Ada now, uh, former Governor Dunleavy Chief of Staff, former <laughs> former Chief of Staff for uh, Bert Stedman on Senate Finance, as a matter of fact. Uh, Randy uh, uh, came in to defend data, didn't do a very good job, said, we got a, we got a report in progress. We've hired somebody to look at all this and to discount it. But by the way, I can tell you what the conclusion is going to be without the report being done. I can tell you what the conclusion is going to be, and Milton and Greg are, are full of it. Um, not a very good defense on the on the part of Raro, but so Ada has been in the in in the news and the uh, and another and the other uh, uh, big time uh, independent company or independent corporation we have out there, state corporation, the Permanent Fund Board has been in the news also for over the allegations uh, that uh, that Ellie Rubenstein has been engaged in sort of self dealing as a member of the board. I using- think. It- well, and the and the permanent fund corporation. I mean, that place leaks like a sieve. We're seeing minutes of internal executive sessions and meetings, and and somebody's a little upset about what's going on because that stuff is making its way into the public eye as soon as it happens. Yeah, exactly right. And and Ellie, I mean, essentially, what Ellie's been doing is putting pressure on on the on the staff of the permanent fund corporation to give to to go out of their way to give special meetings and priorities to. Um, investment companies that she happens to, you know, do business with through her uh, uh, private hedge fund. And, and so there's been that sort of self-dealing issue over there. Uh, and you're right. You know, it, it, they, they had a, there that started, that, that controversy started with leaks to the Alaska landmine leaks of, of internal emails. They had a board meeting that was supposed to address the leaks of the internal emails. Uh, and then they went into executive session and the executive session was <laughs> ended up being open. There ended up being a backdoor into the executive session. So there were notes of that meeting that, uh, that, that found their way to landfield and got published uh, in an article. So these two, these two boards have, have, have been in, have been in sort of constant turmoil and constant, you know, the constant public eye. And I've tried to think through it. it, it there, there's a common theme and I've tried to think through what's really going on here. And I think the problem is we've got two boards in which, or two corporations, state corporations, in which we put a lot of money. We put a lot of money into ADA uh, over the years, and the state continues to put more and more money uh, into into ADA. Um, and we've and, and bonding authority and, and authority to raise even more money over in ADA. And obviously, there's a lot of money in the permanent fund corporation. And I think what we've done is we put a lot of money in these corporations with the, with the, with good intentions, the expectations that it will grow into more money, certainly in the case of, of uh, the permanent fund corporation, and that it will grow into jobs and additional investment in the state in the case of ADA. Good, good purposes with both. But we haven't put a lot of sideboards around, around this money. 
And I think what we're seeing is this money is attracting a lot of, of less than good dealings. Um, would you say shady players? I mean, that, that, you know, self-serving. I mean, if nothing else, I mean, the thing with Ellie Rubenstein, I mean, that is definitely self-serving when she's pressuring the employees and the investment employees at the at the permanent fund outside of her, you know, from her position as a board member to say, do business with these people uh, because it benefits me in the long. I mean, that's, it, you know, it's the very definition of self-serving. Yeah, and you've got Ada, who's who, in all honesty, has just sort of gone off on a frolic and detour in a lot of these things. They were the sole, it ends up there, they were the sole leaseholder, the predominant bidder, and ended up as other people dropped out, the sole leaseholder of, of leases, oil and gas leases in Anwar. Well, <laughs> the industry, the industry is not even investing in Anwar anymore. They're not even uh, investing in, in those leases. And we've got a state corporation who has all, no oil and gas development skills investing uh, in, in those leases. That was, I mean, it was fairly obvious that was a political push. It was, a, it, was, it was to make political points, not investment points, not return points um, uh, with respect to the ANWR leases. And then we've got this whole stuff going on with Ambler. We have people dropping out <laughs> like flies. I mean, I mean. Doyan was in was 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 allied allied with the Am Ambler project, but then has gotten upset with the way Ada has been progressing it, and Doyan dropped out. And now Nana, the regional corporation for Northwest Alaska, has dropped out. has has removed its permission to use Nana lands in connection with the with the Ambler project. We have people, you know, walking away from Ambler. The Biden administration has said, you know, that it that they're not going to give the federal permits to develop Ambler. Uh, it, we have people walking away from Ambler. But again, Ada keeps investing in it, in all honesty, to make political points. Rick Halford had a great op-ed, had a great editorial in the ADN this past week, or maybe just maybe the week before, talking about, you know, that, that we're going down the wrong road with Ada. Rick Halford, who was president of the Senate uh, a, a number of years back, a longtime participant in and observer of Alaska politics, said Ada's, Ada's just outliving or outgrowing what his original purpose was. It's becoming a tool of whatever administration's in power, giving them a lot of money and sort of instructing them to, to spend this money or invest this money in connection with political objectives the administration has, as opposed to investment objects, objectives that serve serve Alaska. So I think, I think what we've done is we've given a lot of money to these two agencies, to the Permanent Fund Corporation and to Ada, without the sideboards necessary to, to constrain it. I mean, with, to make sure that it doesn't go off in unproductive directions. And I think the legislature needs to step in right. and, to, and to have a deep evaluation of what's going on at these two agencies, understand where they've gone off the, gone off the track um, and put sideboards in terms of legislation, put sideboards on that restrict what Ada is doing in a way that you know brings it back to its original purpose, and and adopts, if necessary, adopts a bunch of regulations with respect to the permanent fund board to make sure we don't get into this self dealing situation and other situations that are that are inappropriate for the permanent fund board to do. Well, because we're not talking about an insignificant amount of money, obviously with a permanent fund. I mean that's billions and all, but even Ada, I mean they've got one point four billion dollars cash on hand in their in their. I mean. It's not an insignificant amount of money that they're just running amok with. And they are basically, Halford's argument is that they're basically bypassing the statutory authority of the legislature. Uh, right now, they can issue $25 million without any kind of approval. They can give $25 million bucks to anybody. Uh, and now they're asking for it to go up to $100 million to just anybody. And with all the double dealing and everything else we've seen with the Rubenstein and all this other kind of stuff, who knows who's getting these $25 chunks of money, $25 million chunks of money. It could be anybody. It could be, you know, your best friend kind of thing. I mean, it, it needs sideboards in that regard for sure. It does. I, I, Halford, Halford essentially argues that it's become, that it has become a slush fund, a political slush fund for the governor, for the governor of the day uh, in terms of, you know, doing things like taking the money and investing in Anwar leases or investing in the, in the, in the, uh, Ambler Road project, and and that it needs to be brought back to its fundamental basic of developing legitimate 
opportunities for the state um, uh, from a standpoint of, in, of industrial development, from the standpoint of state jobs and, and, and the standpoint of, of in-state return. And, and, and I think that, I, I think that has a lot of, a lot of merit to it. So it's, I, I think the common theme here is we've given a lot of money <laughs> to, to these agencies without putting sideboards on it. I mean, I, you and I have talked on the show before about the need to professionalize the board at, uh, uh, at, uh, the permanent fund corporation. I mean, we got a, we got a bunch of people who are not really investment savvy, uh, uh on that board, trying to direct uh, a corporation that historically has been pretty, pretty, pretty good at, at investment returns. And now we've got the board members messing in it. They've got the board members trying to give, you know, trying to bypass the, the chain of command and go directly to staff and give staff direction on who they ought to be investing in. It's, um, we need we need to sort of back up, reset the our thought process around those two. Now that we got a lot of money in them, reset our thought process around those two agencies. Put sideboards on them, and uh, and and let them let them keep going on their merry way with the sideboards in place, as opposed to sort of the free free flowing, free range uh, uh, authorities they have now. Quickly, one minute here, Brad. Um, we've talked about how to reorganize the PFD or the the Permanent Fund Court Board. What's your suggestion for ADA? Um, what, what what would you suggest for that? I think I think both corporations need legislative need legislative approval of the board members and and you know people will say well that politicizes the process it, it, it the the process is already politicized I mean you're allowing the governor to make the appointments and and the process is already politicized what happens if you go through legislation the legislative approval is you get a bunch of a bunch of questions and you get a bunch of of, of examination that you're not getting in the process now when the governor can just appoint it, whoever his friends are. Um, and I think there needs to be professional standards on who's on the, on the ADA board. It's not a heck of a lot more professional in terms of investment savvy than what we've got on the permanent fund corporation right now. Well, so, Randy Raro doesn't have a huge, deep, uh, vast, uh, pocket of, of investment, uh, knowledge that he's throwing on there. Well, the board members don't have a, a yeah. vast, huge amount of knowledge, investment knowledge. I, uh, I mean, we ought to treat them as the invest as the investment funds they are, and, right. and put investment savvy people on them. I mean, I don't mean to bang on Raro, but I mean, <clears throat> at some point, you got to be like a billion, a one almost a billion and a half dollars in there. Their track record is spotty at best. Although I noticed that uh, I noticed that Must Read had an article that uh, how did how did she put it? That it was all uh, that it was all George Soros dark money. Um, <laughs> what was that? What was the time? It, I was sorry. I was trying to. I was trying to find the uh, video shocker. Senator Jesse Keel aligns with George Soros, the Aravella Advisors, and New Ventures funds to try to take down Alaska economy. The because the committee gave Salmon State forty minutes to present to talk about. Uh, you know, I mean. I, <laughs> Yeah, look, I'm not a George Soros fan. Don't get me wrong, but at some point you got to be like, if it's a spade, it's a spade. Have they really produced anything? Uh, and Barker was on the board of Adia. I mean, he knows this thing inside and out. So, I mean, at some point you got to be like, have you really produced anything in 40 years? Oh, and and Erickson is a longtime observer of the legislature and uh, and state government. Is an economist by by training. Was a was I think the state economist at one point published a, a, a deep dive uh, a publication looking into state finances uh, for a number of, uh, from a number of years. Greg, Greg has a very, I know Greg well, and Greg has a really good feel for, for the state. So yes, it was sponsored by Salmon State. Uh, yes, it was, and Salmon State may or may not be funded by Soros or whatever, but, but it was, it was a study done by Milt Mark Barker and, and Greg Erickson, both of whom have their reputations on the line. And both of whom understand this stuff, and and a deep dive into you know whether they're achieving whether they're achieving it, and not only that, you got Rick Halford, who's not financed by Salmon State. Uh, you got Halford out there, sort of joining in and saying, "Look, we've gone off we've gone off track here with what uh, with what Ada is doing." So, yeah, it's a, it's an easy easy pick to say, "Ooh, Salmon State bad," uh, but you got to look at who's doing the the work. It's Barker and. Erickson and and Halford who are who are critiquing it, and in all honesty, I mean I don't I don't know what Ada's doing. Uh, it's been what a year maybe maybe more 
since Barker and, uh, and uh, uh, Erickson's first uh, study was published, looking at what would have happened if we'd taken the money that, that got invested in ADA and invested it and set instead in the, in the permanent fund corporation. It's been a year or more. And the immediate reaction to that at the time by ADA was, oh, well, that's wrong. We're going to do a study and shows it, show it's wrong. And, the, and they've never published the study. They, 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 and, and when Raro got up to testify, it was, we're still doing the study. <laughs> the study's going to, the study's going to come out soon. So, you know, you know, it's not like Ada hasn't had the chance to respond to this. Uh, how long does it take to look at us? How long does it take to do a study? anyway? Well, we've got to study the study that we studied before with a study that we've created to study that study. I mean, that's, it's the Alaska study industry all over again. Uh, you know, where they just basically, you got people who are circling the, you know, vultures circling the yard, just picking up study after study after study. Uh, they'll find one. And like you said, Rara was already telling you what the study was going to find. <laughs> how, yeah. how, how does that we, work exactly? We, we haven't done the study yet. We haven't come to the conclusions, but here's what the conclusions are going to be <laughs> when, when yeah, we I mean, come to it. Yeah. And I mean, if you, if you believe that, then you, you know, I'll sell you some beachfront property in Arizona at this point. Uh, I mean, this happens over and over and over again. And and look, I love the idea of ADIA, right? I mean, it, the, the concept of it was great. I mean, originally a bonding authority for federal bonds that couldn't be done by individuals and giving the opportunity for other businesses. But if it's just become this slush fund, if it's just become this ability for any sitting governor to then direct it however they want as a, you know, again, as a, as a political tool to use however he wants. That's not what the intent was. And the fact that they have a billion and a half dollars sitting around to do it with is that that's the problem. I mean, that's money that could be used somewhere else uh, well, for yeah. sure. And, and, and Ada, what, what Ada, what Ada is used for, uh, what that money is used for, the returns that Ada does generate is used for is to, is to support the general fund, right? I mean, Ada periodically dividends back to the state, back to the, back to the general fund, the shareholder, uh, dividends back to the state, uh, the profits or some amount of return that, uh, that ADA has generated. So that billion plus that's sitting over there is state money. I mean, nobody, nobody argues that it's, it, it's like, it's like another, uh, statutory budget reserve that's right. sitting over there. The legislature could say, could say tomorrow, give it back. We're going to use it in connection with, with, you know, balancing the budget. But they don't do that. They leave it over there, and and the governor turns it into whatever, well, the governor yeah. of the day turns it into whatever he turns it into. Hey, a billion and a half there, a billion in the PCE, a billion here, a billion there. I mean, how much money is floating around in all these various funds doing whatever? Don't worry, they're going to tap your PFD super hard, and it just won't be any. In fact, what what did somebody say earlier? Gary said that apparently they passed the senior exemption. From 150 now to 450 thousand dollars, uh, that would absolutely drive other funding sources, including the PFD and sales taxes. I mean, that's that's coming too. It's it's all dead ahead. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We're working on the weekly top three. Uh, moving over to number three, and this is the question of what did the Prop A vote in Fairbanks that happened here a week ago? What did it teach us? What is what is the state able able to learn? from uh, this vote. Uh, now, I had some commentary on this to begin with, Brad. I felt like this vote was going to fail. Um, I thought it was going to be close, uh, but uh, it obviously was a blowout over two to one when it was all said and done. Uh, I thought it was going to be a lot closer, but I did think it was going to win strictly because uh, the metrics across the nation right now, it seems like everybody is focusing on the economy, inflation and everything else. I'm out in the business world dealing with businesses and business owners, and they're all nervous. They're all, you know, a lot of them cutting back their spending on advertising and other things. They're, they're battening down the hatches because they're concerned. And so when I saw this, I thought, oh, this is not going to fly. Uh, I thought it was going to, but I thought it was going to be a squeaker. Instead, it was a complete and total blowout. Your thoughts? Well, yeah, I mean, Fairbanks has been electing fairly liberal uh, 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 assembly members and 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 North Star Borough uh, members um, uh, recently, and so yeah, you might think that Fairbanks has become sort of liberal. And you know, looking at it, I, I got to say, I'm looking at this from a distance, right? I I wasn't in Fairbanks, I didn't see that the dynamics that are going on in Fairbanks. I don't, I don't, you know, truly understand the dynamics that have caused, you know, the, the election of more liberal members to the, 
to the to the city council and 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 otherwise uh, to the borough council and otherwise. I I just I I don't I don't quite understand that. My take on it from 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 a distance is that this is an indication that when you when you try to raise broad based taxes when you when you try to you know impose an increased tax burden uh, on on a broad base uh, as as increasing the tax cap would have done on property taxes would have would have you know increased the the property the concern was would have increased property taxes when you do that you get pushback you finally get pushback and and I take it as 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 a less one lesson to be learned from this is using using broad based taxes to raise revenue does have an impact on spending levels because people when it's broad based people will push back on that they'll see it they'll see it as an attack on them as an attack on their economics and they will push back on that in a way that we haven't been seeing it with you know using PFD cuts to right. fund government because PFD cuts fall only on only on certain segments of, of of Alaska they only fall on middle and lower income Alaska families they don't fall on the oil industry they don't fall on, on non residents and on the industries that hire non residents they don't fall on the top twenty percent and so you you're you're able to isolate the attack you're able to isolate the tax isolate the burden on one group. And you don't get broad pushback. What happened in Fairbanks to me, again, looking at it from the outside, is is the tax was going to be on a broad group. It was going to be on all property tax owners um, uh, in the borough, and so it was it you, the, the, that generated a broad pushback against uh, against that spending level, and uh, and, and, and it brought out the vote, an increased vote than what they've seen in recent elections brought out a higher vote because people were a broad base of people were engaged and brought out a broad base pushback against that. And I, and I think it, so I think one of the lessons learned out of this is broad based taxes work in a way, in, in, in a way to generate the pushback that we've been looking for uh, at the state level, but haven't been able to, to achieve because they've been targeting the burden on, on just this one small segment. I will say that uh, that's probably part of it. Um, um, I would say first and foremost that I think uh, one of the reasons why Fairbanks has turned more purple than red, uh, you know, uh, there's still segments, obviously it's segmented, you know, blue out by the university, red out by North Pole, et cetera, et cetera. But more, I think more of anything else, a lot of times people have just kind of thrown their hands up in the air um, and they're frustrated with the situation and they've kind of walked away. I saw that before I left the assembly. When I got on the assembly was fairly balanced. By the time I left, it was seven to two. There was only two of us that were conservative at all. Uh, and it had just slowly progressed down that way. I think also the attack on the tax cap itself probably infuriated a lot of people because the tax cap is coming up in October for a renewal. And so they knew that this was happening and they could have put it on the ballot then, but they decided to end run it and do it on this thing. Then you had the fact that the, the mayor had found an additional $13 million laying around that they could have used and that they still moved forward. And then the final insult to injury was the fact that they kept saying it was for the children, for the children, save our schools was the slogan <laughs> of their thing. And the fact is, is that that money is not guaranteed to go to anything. It goes into the general fund. It could be appropriated for that. It could be appropriated for something else. Um, but I think overall, it was the fact that people are up to here, especially since in Fairbanks specifically, I received a lot of different emails and comments from people that bumped into me when I was in Fairbanks that talked about how their assessments had gone up. One one of my friends sent me a text said his assessment has gone up $135,000 in the last three years. And so the combination of all those things with the economy the way it is, people worried about it, the increase in taxes, that you can't get any more blood from the stone. You've attacked the tax cap. You've lied to the people to say that it's for the children. You had the money, but you went ahead and tried to bust the tax cap anyway. I think it was a combination of things, and I think it was a pushback against the narrative of we need as much money as we can get, and as long as it's for the children, it's going to be okay, and I think it was a repudiation of that. Yeah, I, that, that makes that makes a lot of sense. I. It, 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 one of the things that's, that's striking me as I sort of look at elections around through the state 
is and look at you know the legislative districts and gubernatorial races is it's easier for um, progressives to win if the issue is overspending how we spend money. Um, we should spend more. I mean, examples are we should spend more for the schools. Yeah, I agree with that. Conservatives tend to tend to resist that. Progressives tend to push that. And so people, well, okay, spending. Yeah, I want to spend more money on schools. And I want to spend more money on, on school maintenance. And I want to spend more money on infrastructure. And I want to spend more money on this. And I want to spend more money on that. That, that, that when elections are about spending, you tend to have progressives uh, uh, have an advantage in those. When elections are about paying for it, paying for that spending, like I, Prop a, I would like I view Prop A as as being in part who who pays and you and and the and the and the election is you pay broad based y'all pay more that that you tend to have more conservative results that that people say oh I'm not I don't want to pay for this yeah it's nice to spend on it I, I mean I'll vote for it if we're if we're talking about spending this stuff I'll vote for people who want to spend it on this or that or the other thing. But if I have to pay for it, if, if the if the election is about me paying for it, that I have to come up with the money for it, broad based, you know, across the board, everybody's going to have to come up with money for it. Then there tends to be a lot more pushback, and you tend to have more conservative results. And so I, in one of the, so one of the things I'm sort of taking away from not just this election, but sort of in the aggregate, if people can make the elections about who pays for it, right, and you're going to pay for it. And, and it's, you know, and what, what they're trying to do is to make you pay for it. Right. If you can make the election about that, you tend to have more conservative results. If you let the election be about, oh, I want to spend it on this, or I want to spend it on that, or I want to spend it on the other thing. Then you engage all of the special interests and they all sort of, you say, oh yeah, well, you know, spending on that's good. So I'll support, I'll support uh, this candidate. What we've allowed to happen in this state through using PFD cuts at the state level, what we've allowed to happen at this in, in this state is for the state to isolate who's paying off on a bunch of people who, frankly, don't have the time and energy to get that deeply involved in state politics and to understand what's going on. And so you've allowed the, you've allowed the elections to be much more on, on where we spend it um, uh, people to argue about where we're going to spend it, then, then focus it on who pays for it. And you all are going to have to pay for it. And we're going to be taking it out of your pocket because yeah. we've allowed this segmentation and it doesn't affect the top 20% who vote as a, as a, as a general rule, have higher turnout rates than, than the other 80%. We, we've allowed the top 20% to escape. We've allowed the oil industry to escape. And, and so their advertising dollars aren't at work pushing back. You know, advertising and lobbying dollars, we allowed the non-res ind industries to escape. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree totally. Uh, and Rob Meyer says, this is why the feds have so much debt. Everybody wants to spend, but nobody wants to pay for it. They don't, they don't ask the people if they're going to pay for it. They just borrow the money. And that's exactly why we're in the same problem. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Hopefully we learned something from this. Uh, I hope the other, I hope the other parts of the state are paying attention. We'll see what goes on. Now, I do have to agree with uh, this, and I didn't stop you because you were on a roll. Conservatives aren't against school spending, but we are against spending with no accountability. There's no blanket spending, right? Just like we need more money, so spend it. So, I mean, conservatives aren't against the funding of schools. It's just this idea that more money, more all the time with no accountability or no metrics is a good idea. Yeah, but and I guess it's a matter of degree, right? Conservatives believe that there ought to be accountability and there ought to be a limitation on the amount spent to, to the extent you can make it accountable. And and if there's if there's you know spending beyond that, that uh, that that it ought to be cut off. Progressives tend to believe just more and more and more uh, without without sort of the cutoff for accountability. I, I I agree with that, but but generally generally speaking. Yes, general in generalization, you're right. I mean, progressives are all for it, and conservatives are against it. In that yeah, and, and generally speaking, I'm I, I, I'm sort of coming to this theory of 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 what moves what moves elections. I mean, the problem at the federal level, um, 
Rob's right. I mean, the, the problem, but the problem at the federal level is that that you, the state can, or the nation can take on debt, right? I mean, a lot of debt, growing amounts of debt, huge amounts of debt, uh, uh, fiscally fiscally uh, threatening debt. Yeah. And so and so it's not really. I mean, so at the federal level, debt sort of serves the function of the PFD. You're sliding it off on a, on on future generations who don't really see it and don't have a don't really have a voice in it. Yes, we do have a tax system, but taxes only pay for a portion of the spending. The rest of it is 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 being funded by debt, and so you get away with additional spending because you don't you're pushing it off on somebody that can't fight can't fight back. I I I I I want you can't do and you can't do that at the state level. I I, I want to say that that I want to take a lesson from Fairbanks. Maybe I'm creating the lesson to take, but I want to take a lesson from Fairbanks. That if you if you engage if you if you if you're if you make the election about who pays if you make the election about you're going to have to pay more if you make the election about you know we're taking it out of your pocket on a broad based basis that you get significant pushback I mean yeah you, you you can't take that out of Anchorage bond elections because the bonds are in part subsidized by the state um, and so you know <laughs> you always get this argument that. Yeah, approve the bond. You only have to pay for you know fifty percent of the cost. The state's going to pay for the rest of the cost, and they pay that through PFD cuts. And so you get away with you get away with that. I I I I, I like the the results of the of the Fairbanks election, and I'm trying to make sure that we understand the lessons of it to to be able to adopt right. those lessons in other situations. No, I mean I don't think it was any single one thing. I think it was a combination of things. I think definitely you're right when people discovered, you know, who pays that they have to do it for sure. Brian I think also hits it when he says and it was right on the heels of the school board debacle over accusing certain legislators of accepting bribes. That didn't help endure the education complex to the taxpayers. I think that there was just a there's a that there was just a portion of outrage from people for a variety of reasons, whether it was because it was the attack on the tax cap, whether it was because the money was found by the mayor and promised to them, and yet they continued to go ahead. Uh, they refused to include it in a regular election. They spent, expended, you know, $100,000 of, of borough money to have a special election. I think that's why you saw people rise up. Um, and there was a big turnout from the North Pole area, which has been kind of quiet the last few elections. Uh, and there were a lot of people that turned out out there. Tammy was going to give me the the breakdown once all the voting came through, but it was a pretty significant jump. And I think partially this maybe the sleeping you know maybe the sleeping giant had awakened a little bit. That silent majority finally stood up and said, "You know what? That far, but no farther." Um, uh, and I think it had to do with all of those things, uh, but economy especially because people are are deeply concerned. Uh, all the polls are showing nationwide, but here in Alaska, especially, I'm talking to these business owners, and they are deeply concerned about what's going on in the economy. All right, so so Michael, the the thing is, we've got these we've got state elections coming up, right? We're gonna we're gonna elect uh, what 50 legislators, 40. All the House members are standing. Half of the half of the Senate will stand. We're gonna have 50 legislative elections. The 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 the, the challenge here is to take what happened in Fairbanks. And and to apply and to learn the lessons and apply those lessons in these legislative races, and 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 use that as a tool to 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 create a pushback yeah. to where to where Juno has been going, and so I think I think there's a usefulness in trying to distill down what happened in Fairbanks because of how big the vote was, distill down what happened in Fairbanks and and try to extract from that tools or arguments or, 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 uh, you know, uh, themes that can be used in these state legislative races to push back on, right. on, on those who want to just, you know, keep spending forever at the expense of middle and lower income Alaska families. I, and I think it's going to continue. I mean, Tammy was talking about how they've spent all the way up to the tax cap. There is no wiggle room. There is no more. We're under the cap. We can expand next year because we're under the cap. They've spent all the way up. And I think, again, that goes back to, well, who pays? That means that the property taxpayers is going to be on the hook for something new um, if they continue to expand and they continue to push back. So I think the, I think the, the messaging here should be along the lines of, you know, you're going to have to pay for all this great government whether it's through property taxes, you know, maybe the PFD could be made an argument, but whatever it is, after the PFD's gone, they're coming for you and your dollar. It's going to happen.
End of story. Uh, I got 30 seconds here, Brad. Well, I, that's that's the challenge. I think in, in this and in, in subsequent programs, we need to sort of try to try to ferret that out and, and turn that into a theme that can be applied in these state legislative races. We'll see what happens. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend. As always, it's great to talk with you. We look forward to talking to you again next week. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. We'll have that big recap on the uh, on what happened at the session. Oh, man, it should be awesome. Thank you, Brad. We'll see you later. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.